Assalamu alaikum. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Kareem Khairi. And today I'm going to present my project, which is on this course, which is my 4.2 calculus curriculum. Uh, simply, my project uh, covers two main points, which are firstly, uh, first of all, the reduction from quantum mechanics into classical mechanics, as well as the back integral formalism of quantum mechanics. Uh, in the beginning, I was to with Professor Khairi. He would, would it help me a lot on covering the material and understanding it. Then, uh, my presentation could be divided into four main parts. Uh, first, I'll be talking about the use of current separation in physics. Then, I will be talking about the geometric optics and wave optics uh, in order to address the question of Hamilton. Then, I'll be talking a little bit about quantum mechanics. So, um, one practical use of calculus variation in physics is simply in dynamical systems. So there we simply define uh, a functional, which we call uh, the action, and it's defined as the time integral of the difference between the kinetic and potential energy. And by minimizing that action, uh, we are able to find the equation of motion. And very obviously, the goal in mechanics is to find the equation of motion. And by such method, uh, we are able to analyze very complicated systems, such as here, for example, we have a pendulum which is attached, uh, what, in which its supports is not simply fixed, but it's attached to, uh, and it's free, I mean, to rotate in a circle. And if you just imagine how chaotic will be that system, it just will drive you crazy. I mean, the support is moving in a circle, uh, so the motion of the pendulum will be very uh, strange. Uh, another example is now we have two pendulums, so one is attached by the other, and just trying to figure out the force that one pendulum is acting upon the other will drive you crazy. Uh, and giving such problems and systems to typical engineers um, and asking them to find the equation of motion, I mean, their faces will turn blue trying to figure out the equation of motion. But uh, thanks to calculus variation, uh, in like half a page, we'll do the job of finding the equation of motion. So, uh, I have talked about the practical use of calculus variation physics. Now, on a more theoretical ground, um, calculus variation could be used elegantly to derive the following. First, uh, Maxwell equations, which are the fundamental equations in the crystal magnetism uh, and simply governs uh, light. Um, also, in thermodynamics, um, perturbation is very useful when we talk about the concept of entropy. Then we have also in quantum mechanics, um, there the essential equation is a Schrodinger equation, which could be derived using uh, curvature variation, as well as to develop a very solid uh, formalism for quantum mechanics, which is called the path integral formalism. Also, in classical mechanics, I just chose a few examples. There, by using calculus operation, um, we are not for forced to think of to think of, about the components of any dynamical systems only by the concept of a force. We could only think of the uh, action, and then we could minimize it and find the equation of motion. So we are not constrained to think about forces. And finally, uh, in conservation laws, I mean, like three of the most powerful tools for scientists and engineers are conservation laws and three of them are the linear and angular momentum as well as energy and we could use we could use calculus variation and very simple intuitive assumptions to end up uh, proving that these three quantities are observed in our universe so it's really very helpful uh, and my aim in this presentation or I intend to focus on quantum mechanics as well as its links on classical mechanics. And I did forget about uh, Einstein. I mean, also in general relativity, we have Einstein field equations. It could be also derived using the first operation. Now, moving to the second point. Um, in wave optics, light is being treated as a wave. And we do have somehow a rough idea about what a wave is, right? Like, it's simply a disturbance of a medium. 
And one point that is worth mentioning about wave is that they do interfere in a very specific way, which will usually be called an interference pattern. And that's exactly what happens when we shine a light on a wall which has two slots. Um, the resultant of that interference will be simply a, an interference pattern, which simply what would we accept, expect if we thought of light as being a wave. So that's one reason why we think of light as being a wave. On the other hand, we have uh, geometrical optics, which treats light as simply <coughs> as straight lines. So you could think of wave optics being like the general theory, and geometrical optics being a special case of that. And more into that is the thing that um, wave optics reduces to geometrical optics in the case that lambda goes to zero, which means that if the lambda, the, the wavelength, is very small compared to the physical system or the surrounding. Um, only then, the complexity of being the wave will reduce to simply being the lines. Um, and, that, and that approximation is only valid in the case that lambda is very small. Uh, one great example that's been given by Richard Feynman is that, say that I'm looking this way, uh, and there's another guy standing here and looking that way. So in order for me to see what's in front of me, uh, light must, must be moving this way. And the same applies for the other guy. But since light is a wave, these two coming uh, light should interfere. But obviously, I do see what's in front of me and not disturbed at all, right? It's very clear. And the reason why is that, well, in, the, in this big, big scale, interference do cancel out. So the resultant wave is undisturbed. That's why in such big scale, it's sufficient to treat light as simply as lines. Um, and that, but, not, but it's not always the case. In some other cases, the general way is to treat light as waves to, in order to predict its behavior. So, uh, in geometrical optics, there's a principle called Fermat's principle of this time. And in classical mechanics, there is another principle called Hamilton's principle. And these two principles are somehow similar. And in general, these two fields have some similarities between, between them. And one of, one of the very few to notice this similarity is Hamilton. So he asked this following question. He said, well, if uh, wave optics do reduce to geometrical optics in the limit that lambda goes to zero. And since geometrical optics is very similar to classical mechanics, is there a field which reduces to classical mechanics in some limit? Uh, um, so the picture would be something like this. And surprisingly, the answer was to be found later is what we call what, awake mechanics. Nowadays, we call it quantum mechanics. Uh, and Basically, it's a very, very weird uh, theory. And to give you a flavor of how we did it, I will be giving two examples. When scientists investigated the world of the very small, namely um, electrons, atoms, and small particles, they found out that the rules governing the such particles are just too weird, and they are counterintuitive. They even contradict what we know from, from classical mechanics. Um, few features are for example, the interference. You, uh, I, I did just mention the interference pattern that result from uh, from light. If we just did the same experiment, but now instead of shining light, we are shining electrons, the same interference pattern will appear. Which can never be the case if you thought of electrons as simply being a particle. You would never expect such pattern to happen, to appear, if electrons are, if you thought of electrons are, as just being a particle. Um, the other thing is diffraction. So here you have a diffraction of X-rays, simply waves, and in the other picture you have diffraction of uh, electrons. So in a way, uh, it's, it's appears to be that electrons and generally matter could behave some way as waves, which is somehow weird since Intuitively, we, thought, we think of particles and waves to be very different stuff. Another thing is what we call a particle in a box. So simply let's uh, consider 
a one conditional box which simulates like a tube, and a particle is confined in it, so it can only move back and forth. Um, and apparently, if we give the particles a specific energy, we will never find it in the middle point of the tube, which dictates that the particle is moving from one region of the tube to the other without crossing the middle point, which is simply impossible or even crazy. If you thought of an electron as just being a particle. So this is just how weird this is. The thing is that classical mechanics work, right? I mean, we have cars, we have airplanes, we have factories, and they are all based and constructed using classical mechanics. Although the, all the ideas from classical mechanics do break down when you come to quantum mechanics. That's why we are led to the correspondence principle, which states as the following. It says, it says, well, as the quantum number increases very large, but in, increases in a very large matter, um, the prediction of quantum mechanics do coincide with the prediction of classical mechanics. So in simple words, um, when we talk about cars, airplanes, and factories, it is OK to use classical mechanics, because its prediction will be the same of those predictions made by, by quantum mechanics. Uh, the point worth mentioning here is that the correspondence principle is not a mathematical one. So back to this picture. The masterpiece done by Richard Feynman, um, a Nobel Prize winner of physics, is to show mathematically how this reduction of quantum mechanics into classical mechanics is being made. And the thing that has to go to some limit is simply h bar. So we have this uh, performed uh, picture in which we have in one end wave optics being reduced to geometrical optics indicates that lambda goes to zero. And since classical mechanics and geometrical optics are somehow similar, we also have a field which is quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics, which reduces to classical mechanics in the case that h bar goes to zero. So now we have a very beautiful uh, picture of how our theories are being connected, which I would like to refer to as the snow at the top of the mountain. But the thing is that in order to reach the snow, you have to go through the mud, which I mean by doing the math. So let's start by doing 